Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Vienna Live with Simeon Morrow and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please go to the LinkedIn live video feed, the link to which I will now place in the chat room. This show thrives on participant contributions and all participants are encouraged to actively participate by asking questions and making comments. To do so, please write in the chat room or turn on your microphone and say hi. We'll be delighted to include your perspective in the conversation. Tonight, our featured guest is Hilary Gardner, a jazz vocalist whose latest album, On the Trail with the Lonesome Pines, is the subject of tonight's conversation. <laughs> From the Rio Grande But my legs ain't bowed And my cheeks ain't tanned I'm a cowboy who never saw a cow Never roped a steer Cause I don't know how And I sure ain't fixing to start in now Yippee-i-o-ki-yay Yippee-i-o-ki-yay I'm an old cow from the Rio Grande and I learned to ride for I learned to stand I'm a riding fool who is up to date and I know every trail in the Lone Star State cause I ride the range in a Ford V8 Welcome, Hillary. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Hillary, tell us a little bit about where you come from, how your musical tastes were formed, and uh, why you decided to become a jazz vocalist. Well, I don't know that I decided it, but I think it was just something that that um, I, a mentor told me once. He said, you didn't choose music. Music chose you. I was really burned out. I was thinking about leaving music. And he said, well, you can, but you'll still be a musician. That part's not up to you. If you leave music, you'll just be a frustrated musician. <laughs> so um, so I, I stayed in. Uh, but I was born in the Midwest. I was born in Omaha, Nebraska uh, to uh, prairie, prairie people and farmers. And we moved to Alaska just before I turned seven. And that's where I spent uh, the bulk of my childhood from the time I was seven until I graduated high school. And um, during that time, and, and even before, before we moved to Alaska, I had uh, access to a really good record collection. My parents had a really good record collection. And um, and I started discovering um, musicians who would go on to become huge influences in my life. Um, Ella Fitzgerald, Carmen McRae, uh, and, and both Dan Hicks and Patsy Cline figured very prominently in the development of this project. Patsy was one of my first, one of my first singers. Uh, but I always knew I was going to come to New York City. I. I dreamed of New York. I read I read books about New York. Fiction novels um, really gave the city, you know, dimension and, and shape in my mind, my imagination. So um, this this duality kind of lived lived within me for a long time, and um, and jazz was a really big part of that. But I it, it wasn't just the sound and the, and the music itself, although it certainly that was part of it. Um, but I was a little more. Um, I had a bit more of a Catholic palette uh, musically. I, I didn't grow up just a jazz head exclusively. Um, for me, there was a lot of, um, I had a lot, a big romantic attachment to New York City and the, and the whole idea about what jazz was and how it related to that. So the whole, um, you know, as a kid, you know, very, uh, 
very, uh, I don't know, fuzzy, but romantic ideas about like, what's nightlife, you know, I, I was really into Tom Waits, probably too young to be into Tom Waits, but I was really into Tom Waits. And he, um, he, you know, he's a big Los Angelino, but he better than anyone else, I think, writes and, and, and sings and talks about cities in this kind of gritty urban underbelly at night. And I was really intrigued by that. So I, I was always very drawn to cities, but I was, I was growing up in the country. Um, and a lot of the music that was very formative um, certainly falls neatly under this jazz with a capital J uh, umbrella, but also a lot of the stuff that I was really into was kind of a little more in the, in the, in the gray zones between genres. And those dualities have always sort of lived within me. So I suppose it was only a matter of time before I made a record that, that combined all of those influences. So uh, Hillary, just to be clear, so this kind of, uh imagination and this kind of uh, receiving music and kind of dreaming about it is very important to you. Is that, is that right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it was, um, there were, there were places and, and in fact, whole periods of time, you know, obviously I was, I, you know, I was not born at a time when I could have seen, you know, so many of the great performers that I loved in person. Um, but these eras uh, live very large in my imagination. And um, certainly music was, was a major gateway into lives that I've never lived, you know, so definitely. Okay, let's listen to this is Call of the Canyon. It's maybe just the murmur of the night wind Or the sighing of the leaves I hear Or the moonlight on the stream That makes me dream But somehow I feel you near Just a melancholy Lingering when the day is through It's the call of the canyon Once again I'm dreaming of you Every night I search the moonlight Up and down the It's the call of the canyon Maybe I will find you once more Standing there alone by the ashes Of a fire we said would never the call of the canyon bringing back your answer to me okay lovely so uh tell us now hillary about the idea behind this album as you said you, you grew up from nebraska you're living in alaska <laughs> i mean one of the farthest flung places from new york city and it's about as out, far west as you right? can get and still be in the United <laughs> States. Yeah. You find yourself in your dream city living this 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 dream life of jazz successful jazz singer and then you just des you decide to kind of uh, look look the other way, right? I mean, I don't know if I don't know if I would put it that way. It was uh this was a very uh organic process. Um, I started getting really curious about uh, these trail songs. I, I started calling them trail songs because there's not really a genre that they that they fit neatly into. And um, and I was curious about them, uh, particularly in, you know, at, around this time and, and in the spring and summer of 2020, when we were all spending a lot of time at home. Um, and 
naturally being in a one bedroom apartment in downtown Brooklyn, the idea of wide open spaces was very appealing. And uh, I have a friend who's a, he's a, he's a cowboy and a fabulous jazz guitar player. His name is Bruce Foreman and he's on the West coast and um, everyone was doing things online at that time. And Bruce said, why don't you sing something and then send it to me and I'll accompany that on my guitar and put it on Facebook. <laughs> like, yeah. What, why not? Let's do that. And, um, and I, I found the song Twilight on the Trail and I was so captivated by the, the cinematic imagery of the lyrics and the themes of, of the music, which, um, you know, which were really contemplative and, and talking about, you know, the song really suggests musically and lyrically that this sense of melancholy that kind of lives at the edges of solitude and beauty. Um, it talks a lot about nature. It uh, uses the metaphor of twilight on the trail to talk about, I think, a larger story about the end of one's life and how you gauge what really matters in life. So this song, this simple, sweet kind of cowboy song was covering a lot of ground. And I was really, and it was also very beautiful. And so that was kind of a jumping off point. Um, and I started digging more into this repertoire. And, and I just really, I followed my nose, I followed my ears, I followed my heart, and I, I just became immersed in this rep. And um, it definitely was not something that I consider to be a departure or um, a leaving behind of anything I was doing. It, it's, these songs are built like jazz standards. They're, the architecturally, the music is, it, they're, they're malleable in the way that jazz standards are malleable. And, um, and it's the subject matter that's really um, highly specific and, uh, and also really personal. So it felt just like a completely natural um, extension of, of a lot of what I'd already been doing and also just a really, um, I don't know, kind of an embrace of, of my background in a certain way. I mean, the first gigs I ever did were country gigs. I was a, like a karaoke, you know, like at a bar mitzvah, there's like the get the party started dancers that go out and like dance. So I did that for karaoke in Alaska. I was like a karaoke ringer in these crummy little dive bars and I would sing Patsy Cline songs. So that was, that was baked into the cake of my musical life from the beginning. Not that these are but, but these aren't that either. Like these aren't, you know, Patsy Cline songs. These aren't like lovesick blues, although I, you know, I love that. Um, so it was actually a really wonderful kind of melding of of past and 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 future for me. You know, so most with the exception of just two songs on the record, all of the songs are were new to me when when I approached this material. So, you know, I knew I knew I'm an old cow hand very well. Um and had sung it before. And then I had heard, I had a passing familiarity with Cow Cow Boogie. The rest of the other 10 songs on the record I had not heard, and in some cases hadn't even heard of, um, most cases actually, until we started digging into this music. So it was a, it was a real, um, it, it was an adventure. It is an adventure. So before we get into producing the album, let's listen to another song. This is Jingle Jangle Jingle, I Got Spurs. Yippee! There'll be no wedding bells for today. I got spurs that jingle, jangle, jingle. As I go riding merrily along, and they sing, oh, ain't you glad you're single? Oh, ain't you glad? And that song ain't so very far from wrong. It ain't wrong. Oh, Lily Bell. Oh, Lily Bell. song ain't so very far and from that song wrong. it ain't wrong oh mary ann oh mary ann oh mary ann oh, though oh, we mary did some moonlight walking this is why, is why i up and ran and i got spurs that jingle jangle jingle as i go riding merrily along and they sing oh ain't you glad you're single and that song ain't so very far from wrong Oh, I love that. I love that groove. Wow. So tell us uh, now about 
getting the people together to do this here where you said you had to yeah. you know communicate with someone in los angeles i mean when you know i first uh, the album came to my attention and i know that you've gotten some great critiques from uh, you know big newspapers and all that i thought oh my god you know <laughs> this is from a different planet you know i never i, I mean <laughs> Right. So how did you how did you how did you do that? You ask these jazz people, OK, now you're going to play this music that I imagine maybe they've never played before. Well, I mean, as you just heard in that track, that that's just a swinging that's an up tempo swinging tune. So they've absolutely played that music before. You know what I mean? Like, that's just it's a swinger. I've never known anybody more versatile and open and flexible musically than jazz musicians. Um, I knew right away that my friend Noah Garabedian, who is the bass player that you hear on the record, I knew right away that I wanted to have Noah on the project um, because we had done, Noah and I have known each other for years and we have done a lot of different kinds of gigs together. And I've observed as a fan myself of Noah, um, I have observed his own his own work, his own gigs and, um, and he's a and he's an eclectic, uh, very broad-minded musician, and I've heard him play in a bunch of different styles. So, um, and he's just like fantastic hang. So I just I see that's me when I've had professional hair and makeup. That that makes a big difference in in my life. Um, but uh, but I knew I wanted Noah, and I also knew that Noah was uh, good friends and had had worked closely with the guitarist and vocalist Justin Poindexter. And I was a fan of Justin's as well uh, from afar. We didn't know one another, but uh, through the magic of technology had actually wound up on a recording together before we ever met. Somebody had hired us each to, to be on, on his recording. Um, so I knew that I wanted to work with Justin and you can see, so Noah's the bass player and Justin's got the guitar. And, um, and so Noah and I, trucked up to Washington Heights in, in Manhattan and uh, went to Justin's Justin's place. And we just started playing through some of these tunes and it just felt like we'd been playing together forever. And in fact, you know, Justin and Noah had played together a lot and Noah and I had played together a lot. So we were just kind of completing the triangle there. And then uh, on uh, the right of the screen, you can see the drummer, Aaron Thurston, who um, was the last puzzle piece that clicked into place. Um, I'm a fan and friend of the great singer songwriter, Kat Edmondson. And um, with this project, I felt like finding the right drummer was a really important thing. Um, because it needed to be somebody who was, you know, obviously who was a great drummer, that's a given, but also someone who had kind of a, a mindset um, about, you know, playing spare drums, you know, not filling up every space, not playing too much, not playing too loud. And just, and anyway, I, I thought, gosh, you know, Kat does all this interesting um, and eclectic music and, um, and Aaron is her musical partner and her life partner and i i said do you think aaron would want to do this project and he he did and same thing as soon as he came into the mix it was as though we'd been playing together forever and then justin's wife sasha is a marvelous classical pianist and they have a project together called our band in which uh they both sing she plays accordion he plays guitar and so sasha overdubbed some accordion on a couple of tracks and it was just the fairy dust that that we'd been looking for and we've started bringing sasha into the live shows as well um and she's a fabulous harmony singer so we're getting to do you know three-part harmony which is just all kinds of fun so and then my husband produced the album um and i'm very very lucky to have him as a producer. He's worked with, uh, and he just has a resume as long as your arm with with some, with names on it that are a lot fancier than mine. So I, I'm lucky. I I had a direct line. I was able to get him to produce the album, and and um, he was he's just great in the studio. You know, there's it's it's a it's a balance. You know, you want it to feel free enough that people can experiment and be creative and just have it feel relaxed. Um, but you also, we all need to stay on task and we need to be focused and also to know when something's really working or if it's not working and to kind of, to have that that presence in the studio who can kind of keep an eye on all of those things in a very loving way is, is a real gift. So I lucked out with the producer and the band. Well, it seems, yeah, you can just feel that great energy coming from those photos. I love the photos of you and the band. Thank and you. And so you, I could tell this was really a, a gem of a project. Thank you. So, Let's listen to Under Fiesta Stars. Excuse me, I'm gonna make sure that I'm sharing that the right way. There it is. Mm -hmm. 
We met by a stream way down in Mexico. The moment stood still under fiesta stars. I learned how to dream that night in Mexico. My heart felt a thrill under fiesta stars the night spoke of splendor the lanterns were low i had to surrender the thrill seemed to grow the music was playing we danced until dawn my thoughts began straying and then he was gone okay uh, well i love that accordion so we have a question from laura lee hagan laura lee hi hi laura lee Hi, Hillary. Hi. So did I, you said I have a question or you want me to come up with a question? Please. Oh, I don't know. You have okay, a hand right. raised. Yeah. Oh, I did? No, no. Yeah. I don't know how oh, I did okay. that. Sorry. Oh, well then I'll just take this opportunity to say thank you so much for tuning in. It's great to see of your course, face. Of course, of yeah. course. I do have, a, I do, I could ask a question if now is the time. Please. Please do. Okay. So Hillary, it's uh, clear to anyone who is paying attention to you that you're creative and talented beyond means but I also you know I think you're the most fabulous writer um, that I know and my question is um, I realize you haven't sung every song that's already been written that you'd like to sing but do you ever have any interest or desire to write music um, I have that's a thank you by the way yeah, thank you for saying course. that um, I have written lyrics here and there for things um but I'm not, I would not call myself a songwriter. I, I tend to be, honestly, I'm too loquat. I talk too much. The prose that I write, you know, like songwriting has to be so precise and so pithy. I mean, you're saying everything in like 32 bars. Um, so I haven't done too, but I, here and there I have written lyrics and um, it can be something that's, um, that's a really wonderful experience. There's a, a saxophone player named Harry Allen who wrote a, a song um, and I wrote lyrics uh, for it. Uh, the song is called The Last Best Year. And um, and that was kind of one of those things where Harry had written a melody that was so clear and so um, so lovely and just, just very clear that the lyrics just sort of like came right out. So mm. sometimes, yeah. Great. Okay. So uh, Hillary, I have also a kind of a, a little bit of an, an more intense question this is a philosophical portion of our show and so i want to ask you about the sure. um here's the question hillary the genre of western and cowboy songs isn't really part of country and western music which has a particularly strong connection to appalachia and the so-called hillbillies in the western cowboy genre which started to become popular around the time of the civil war is about life on the frontiers of the united states oklahoma texas arizona and california the genre seems to invoke the romantic vision of Goethe, as heard in Schubert's The Wanderer's Night Song. The songs you sing are usually about a solitary cowboy rancher admiring the vastness of the world he finds himself in, his perceptible yearning for the company of another as he reflects on his solitude, and his steadfast dedication to an unknown calling that only he can hear. Western and cowboy songs is also a very gendered music, it's defined by the feelings and deeds of heroic men, not women. Tell us about this music. How do you understand it? And what does it mean to you? Also, women now commonly sing Schubert. And we just heard you sing cowboy songs so convincingly that all our hats have come off. Does music change meaning when it's sung by a woman instead of a man and vice versa? God, I mean, that's a thesis. That's not a question. That's a dissertation waiting to happen. Um, I mean, 
I would say that, uh, firstly, the, the point about uh, the night wander, I mean, I'm not, I'm not terribly familiar. <laughs> Fun fact, my degree is in classical voice performance, uh, but uh, I am not, I'm not familiar with that. But the themes that you mention are absolutely the themes that are in play uh, on this record. And, um, and what I have been so drawn to with this music is that these songs live in this kind of hinterland where jazz and country and American popular song and Western swing and Americana, these things all kind of converge. The music is all of those things and it's not really any of those things. Um, most of these songs were written for films. Um, so that certainly explains kind of the the, the cinematic quality and uh, the, the, I guess the broad sort of appeal. Um, but so I, I, so all this to say, I am not, um, I am unbothered by its lack of adherence to any particular genre. And um, and while you know, I wasn't sure the project is so specific that when we launched it, I wasn't sure really how it was going to land, if, you know, and it seems happily that that most people are also, you know, unbothered by the, the genre specificity, which is nice. Um, as far as the the history of the American West and the music being very gendered and, you know, as far as regards this project and this music, like I, I am singing about not the literal historical American West. I'm singing about the archetypal American West that lives in our imagination and our collective imagination and, and, and this global collective imagination. I mean, um, the wonderful pianist Monty Alexander is a huge, uh, he's, he's a huge Roy Rogers and Gene Autry fan. He showed up at our CD release show and actually sat in with us, but Monty um, is turning 80 and he grew up in Jamaica watching these films. And, you know, he's like the funkiest, most soulful jazz piano player with all of these, you know, reggae influences. And I mean, he's just, he's an incredible legendary musician. And he came and played on Tumbling Tumbleweeds with us because the music like meant so much to him. So I think these songs and most songs, you know, maybe not all, but really most songs kind of belong to everybody. I, I can't speak to the women who are singing Schubert. I don't know anything about what, what they're up to, but power to them, I say. Um, but I think that the themes that you mentioned, this idea of of contemplation, of solitude, of the, the beauty of nature, of embracing being alone, of longing for someone who's far away. These are human themes. Um, and, and I actually, I think if anything, there's something uh, just really universal and, and, and appealing to everyone. And, and it's been very moving to me to see the amount of nostalgia that this music, which is so new to me, but the amount of nostalgia that this music has provoked in, in listeners of a certain age, you know, they say when I was a little kid, you know, I listened to this, or I, this was my favorite radio program, or I loved Roy Rogers, and they know all this music. And, um, and it's the, it's the songs. It's not that like, I'm a lady singing it. And what does it mean? It's just, they, they hear the song. And, um, and I do think there's something, there's a gift in coming at music that is when one is unencumbered by any previous version or interpretation. I learned most of this music just from sheet music, from vintage sheet music. And then later I would check out recordings here and there, but to come at something as a blank slate, like I've never heard this before. I don't know what this is. What are we going to do with it? It's so exciting. And to let it just kind of take shape on its own is um, it, it's just a real, it's a real gift. So it's been, it's been a delight. And I don't know, I would, I guess I would ask that of listeners, like people who are familiar with this song, like, does it change anything for you that I'm a woman singing this? I don't know, but, uh, but they're great songs. And I do think they have a very broad appeal. So let's listen to, oh, this is Twilight on the Trail. When it's twilight on the train And I jog along The world is like a dream And the ripple of the stream is my song Well 
when it's twilight on the train and i rest once more my ceiling is the sky and the grass on which i lie is my floor Tell us, what do you wish all those who listen to this album? That uh, that I get hired to whistle more on my next recording. Um, I, I hope that these songs uh, start getting uh, more widely known, really. Um, this is kind of a Will Friedwald, who wrote about the, the record in the Wall Street Journal, um, was very kind um, in, in his piece. And he said that... Um, that we've we've kind of discovered a subgenre that nobody really even knew existed, um, and and I do think that this music has kind of been gathering dust for a lot of decades because it is not easily classifiable, and um, so I, I my wish is that people who listen to it first of all that they enjoy it and that maybe it brings them some you know some happiness or peacefulness or whatever it is that they're looking for and then in a broader sense that um that these songs are embraced more and and that that they become more part of what we think of as the great american songbook because they should be they're written by a lot of the same people and um and they're really wonderful pieces of music well if i may say they've found an excellent outstanding ambassador thank so, you that's very they, kind thank you so much let's see how we can stay in touch with hillary so her website is the best place. It's very easy to get there, hillarygardner.com. And Hillary, so we um, can can hit listen now if we want to buy the album. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. That link will take you to wherever wherever you get your music. Uh, you can you can stream it, you can purchase it, etc. And I will say we're doing a vinyl release later this spring. We're going to have actual LPs, which is enormously exciting. Um, so stay tuned for that. Fantastic. Yeah and join the mailing list so you can stay in, uh, up to date. And if people want to reach out to you with questions or uh, comments, they can write you right here. Is that it? Yeah, send me an email. Yeah, I, I love to hear from folks. Absolutely. Fantastic. So feel free to reach out to Hillary. Again, that's hillarygardner.com. And she looks forward to hearing from you. Thank you so very much to Hillary Gardner. Thank you, Simeon. It's been really a pleasure. So let's take a look at what's coming up next week. You can see on the website, we've got lots of new content just waiting, waiting to be discovered. And a lot of content. So we have coming up next week, Benjamin Lackner, last decade, quote, one of Manfred Eicher's skills as a producer is to find the right new voices for his ECM label. Last Decade contains song after luminous song in which Lackner postulates a crystalline idea and a rapt mood. The title track, Open Minds Lost, are especially strong examples of the band's pure searching lyricism. ECM released some fine albums in 2022, but few are more beautiful. End quote. That's from Thomas Conrad of Stereophile. Come welcome jazz pianist Benjamin Lackner to Vienna Live to discuss his newest album, Last Decade. That is next week, uh, next Wednesday. As always, all information about upcoming shows may be found at www.simeonmore.com. Again, that's Benjamin Lackner, Last Decade. 
next Wednesday. Once again, thank you so very much to Hillary Gardner. Thank you to Victoria and Frederick Mulligan and Agnieszka and Benoit Rivole for their support of this show. Thanks to my cousin, Mike, who's an, a marketer for Layer App. If you're an engineer or an architect, they've got a really cool tool you should check out. Thank you also to Mary Schlesinger for the lovely Viennese library you can see behind me. Most of all, thanks to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile from New London, New Hampshire, and New York City, New York. Goodbye. See you next Wednesday.